today we're going to return to the topic of game theory, and we're going to talk about variants of the prisoner's dilemma that vary from it in interesting ways. These are not the same game, but they have a lot of the same features, and they relate to prisoner's dilemmas in a way that is going to make us think, ah, yeah, in some ways these are better. <laughs> in some ways they have their own problems, but we're going to think, what can we do in a lot of cases to turn a prisoner's dilemma into a game that's more manageable, that is a bit easier to solve. So, our first game is going to be something that was discussed by Rousseau uh, when he was setting up his analysis of the social contract, and he takes to be reflective of a lot of broad philosophical and political and social questions about the relationship among members of society. It's called the stag hunt game, and here you see someone with a large stag. Anyway, here is the idea. Two people are going out to hunt. They can either hunt a stag, or they can just go off individually and hunt rabbits. Now, if they hunt a stag, they have to work together. One of them is no, is no match for this large animal that is going to be able to evade them. It's going to take the cooperation of more than one person to do that. On the other hand, it doesn't take more than one person to catch a rabbit. And so they have to decide where to spend their energies. Now, if both of them, let's say, they're good hunters, we imagine, and that if both of them decide to hunt the stag, then their odds of getting the stag are quite good. And so their first choice is that they both hunt the stag and get the big payoff, the large animal that will feed the whole group for weeks. However, they could settle for hunting the hare. Now, if they just go after the rabbits, they might, their odds are good, each individually getting a rabbit, but that doesn't feed many people for very long, so that's not nearly as good. What happens if one says, I'm going to hunt the stag, and the other hunts the rabbit? Well, then, the poor person who decides to hunt the stag has no hope of getting it, right, without the help of the other. And so that's their worst case scenario. They go out hunting and come home with nothing. The person, on the other hand, who hunts the hare when the other person is hunting the stag, well, they're likely to get the rabbit. And actually, their odds of getting the rabbit are a little better than if both are hunting rabbits. After all, that's two people after the same collection of rabbits. If you're the only hunter, maybe your odds of getting one are higher. So the preferences go something like this. We're going to do best, have the best odds of feeding ourselves and the group if we both hunt stag. However, if one of us hunts the stag and the other hunts the rabbit, the poor schmo who's hunting the stag is going to lose out completely. And the other person is going to have the better chance of getting the rabbit. If they both hunt rabbits, that's their third choice. Because they'll get a rabbit with some degree of probability, um, but that doesn't feed nearly as many people. So what should they do? How would you go about addressing this problem? Well, if you're looking at this communally, you say, look, the best outcome is that they both hunt the stag, right? <laughs> So why wouldn't they both hunt the stag? Well, because, now here's the question. Why wouldn't they both just hunt the stag then? Yeah? Is there a possibility of not killing one? There's the, yes, there's the possibility of not killing one. So first of all, it's usually a risky strategy. Yes, your odds are better, but unless it's guaranteed that you're going to get this, you might think, still, there's a chance I won't get it. Um, and so that might be th something. You think, yeah, this has the big biggest payoff, but, but even though our odds are better if we work together, they're still not certain. So there's that worry. Other worries, yeah. They had stag last week, so they feel like <laughs> All right, good. Maybe it's like, ah, yeah, too much stag. Man, the, I'm just not that fond of venison. Okay, so it might be that. Uh, yeah. The value of stag is like different people. Like, the winning that number one might be different. Like, Oh, good. It might well depend. How hungry are we? If we've been having lots of stag, maybe we're tired of stag, but also maybe we're just well fed. We're happy to settle for the rabbit. Uh, yeah. You don't want to deal with how you split up the stag and get work with else. Oh, that's true. This creates a distribution problem, where as if it's just the rabbit, it's just yours, right? Or your family's. You don't have to worry about sharing it. Yeah. People are risk averse, so if you hunt the hare, no matter what you've done, Ooh, that's true. People are risk averse. So you think, 
look, I, 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 I'm hungry, I want food, and I really don't want to end up being in the fourth position, the poor guy who goes home empty-handed. And so, actually, if I'm dependent on the other person, oh, there's, I'm, I'm gonna go home, you know, if, and I get betrayed, oh, then I'm in trouble. So, if I really want to avoid that fourth option, then I, let's say I'm A, I don't want to end up here. And that means I'm going to do this, it's the safer bet. Yeah? You can transport way more gear than you could like a single stag. Ooh, that's true. So I might, be, I might be a clever hunter, but I'm very weak. And so it's like, oh, how will I get the stag back home? <laughs> I mean, that can be a serious problem in a way. Um, uh, in that example, it sounds a little bit silly, but it could be the case. I mean, actually getting a deer, a large deer back, I mean, that's, that can be hundreds of pounds that you have to drag. That's a problem for hunters. Um, so it's a real world problem, but also in another context, right? Think of this as a business proposition. The biggest payoff is this, but how do you actually take that idea that has all that potential and turn it into something? It might be, uh, how do I get that home, right? Suppose you have a brilliant business idea and you think, yeah, that would make me a million. But then you think, how do I actually get from this idea to that million dollars? <laughs> then you realize, oh, it's not so easy, right? There's a lot I have to do. And what if I doubt my ability to do that? Then it could turn out that, that yeah, that's, that's not going to do it. Um, so there are lots of obstacles like that. And indeed, I don't know if you've known anybody who's started up a company. I've done it myself, and I've known people who've done it. I've got, I know a guy who's doing it right now and has done it several times in the past. And sometimes it pays off big for people, but off, I mean, there are a lot of steps to go through, a lot of roadblocks. They're equivalent to bringing the stag home, and sometimes you can't get over all of them. Other things that might worry you here. <clears throat> yeah? Your desire for the stag might be less than your desire for Oh, so mine is, yeah, maybe I'm vindictive, right? Maybe it's like, hey, I want, I don't like you, but you're the only other hunter around, and so I say, yeah, let's go hunting together. And I think, I don't know what's going to happen here, but I really don't want you to get the stack. I want you to end up in that fourth position, okay? So how do I maximize the chances of that happening? I say, hey, let's hunt stag. And then I go after the rabbit and ignore the possibility of catching the deer, and you go home hungry. So I could be, in short, out to betray you. And since I really want you to go home hungry, then I think, okay, yeah, if I'm A, I want B to suffer this fourth thing. Notice how that happens. If I hunt the hare and he hunts the stag. Well, then I don't want to hunt the hare, first of all. Secondly, um, I... I want to say at least I'm hunting stag, but then, uh, yeah, well, it depends on whether I can trust you, whether I think I can dupe you into doing it. So in short, questions of trust, possible betrayal are a serious problem here. Now, if we think this through from each person's party, suppose, first of all, I think of it from A's point of view, and I'm thinking, okay, suppose the other person is indeed going to hunt for the stag. Well, then I, I do best if I hunt for the stag too. So it's not really in my incentive to betray the guy who is hunting stag with me. Our chances are best if we're both hunting the stag. And I'd rather go home with the stag, some, my portion of the stag than with the hare. So it looks like if you're going to hunt the stag, then I should hunt the stag too. But what if you're going to hunt the hare? Well then, gosh, if I go hunting stag and don't even look for a bunny rabbit, and you're hunting the rabbit, then I'm going to go home hungry. So I'm better off also just settling for hunting a rabbit, right? But now you think of things the same way. So B says, well, what if this guy's hunting the stag? I'm better off hunting the stag. But now, <laughs> what if the other guy hunts the rabbit? Well, shoot, if I'm a fool and hunt stag while he's hunting the rabbit, I end up with my worst option. So I better just hunt the rabbit too. So if I put those preferences together and combine these arrows, Look what happens. I end up having arrows leading me from these boxes to this one, but also from those to this one. And so in short, there are two Nash equilibria here. One Nash equilibrium 
is where we're both hunting the stag. That is such that neither one of us can improve our position by changing our mind given what the other person is doing. But the same is true of both of us hunting the hare. If you're going to continue to hunt the hare, then I better hunt it too. I can't improve by hunting the stag. In fact, I'm going to make my situation worse. So there are two Nash equilibria. And to find them, just trace these arrows out and see, ah, this box has arrows coming in and nothing going out. That's a characteristic of a Nash equilibrium. So I get two of those pure strategy Nash equilibria. But now one of them is clearly much better than the other, right? This one gives us, both of us our first choice. This one gives us our third choice. So it's like a prisoner's dilemma in the sense that if we do what seems rational, we're going to end up in one of these boxes and there's a good chance we're going to end up with an optim, a suboptimal outcome. We could have done better. On the other hand, there's at least the possibility we'll end up in the best possible outcome here. Um, and there are multiple Nash equilibria. In the prisoner's dilemma, there was only the one, and it was suboptimal. Here there are two, and one of them is suboptimal. But the other is optimal. We both get the best outcome. So when you think of this in broad social terms, Rousseau is in effect saying, look, it can easily happen that we end up here. <laughs> it also can happen that we end up there. If you think of society as like this, where we say, yeah, if we all cooperate extensively, then actually we can get a big payoff, and that's a win for all of us, hence his idea of the social contract. We can gain by cooperating, so we should commit a lot to the co cooperation and expect our fair share of the fruits of cooperation. But there's a danger. Because if anybody defects, we're in trouble. Okay? This is part of the reason he insists that the basic election of the social contract itself has to be unanimous. Everybody has to be committed because if somebody's left out, for one thing, the application of the social contract to them then will be illegitimate. They haven't agreed to it. But another part of the reason is because it creates an instability. We can easily end up then in an outcome that is the worst of all, where we've cooperated and there are no fruits of cooperation because the other people didn't do it. So what are some real life examples that are like that? You think, well, you know, if we all work together on this, that'll be great. That'll be best for all of us. On the other hand, if you guys don't do your part, then my work is going to be wasted. I'm going to be a chump. Okay, I'd rather not do it at all. Yeah. Group projects. Group projects. <laughs> exactly right. Group projects are like this. And in fact, I have a slide that is meant to illustrate this. Oh, I put it too late. It's after a bunch of things, but here we go. This is basically every group project ever, OK? <laughs> One guy, these are the guys from The Hangover, by the way. It's kind of indistinct here. But this guy does 99% of the work. This one has no idea what's going on the whole time. This says he's going to help, but he's not. And this guy disappears at the very beginning. It doesn't show up again until the very end. Um, that's pretty much exactly what it's like, right? It's part of the reason I hate group projects. They always go like this, OK? One person ends up doing almost all the work. Some people have no idea what's happening. Some promise to, oh, I'll hunt the stag with you. And then they don't do it. They go off and hunt the rabbit, and you're betrayed. And then some people just disappear. Um, luckily, I went to a small college, and there weren't enough of us for people to assign group projects. But the one time there was a joint project, it sort of worked out disastrously. Um, we were to do a joint presentation on some aspect of Jean-Paul Sartre's being in nothingness. So this other guy was supposed to do lots of the work with me. Well, he didn't do any of the work. I did all the work. And then, at the last minute, he said, listen, um, we're not ready yet. Well, he hadn't done anything, so he didn't feel ready, so I wasn't too surprised. But it turned out he lived in a farmhouse out in Bucks County. He said, well, come out here, and we'll work on it together. I said, well, I have no way of getting to Bucks County. And he said, no problem. I'll, I'll come and pick you up. So he comes and picks me up on campus, takes me off to this farmhouse. And I thought, this is the way horror movie star, you know? <laughs> but anyway, we go out to this place pretty far from Philadelphia. And we're talking about Jean-Paul Sartre, and he's giving me these cockamamie ideas. Anyway, 
I said, well, we've got to get back. I mean, our presentation is scheduled for you know, not so long in the future. So we're driving back. And he says, listen, uh, don't worry about being late. I think it's good to be late. We should show up 10 minutes late. He said, I think that's a really bad idea. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's a really bad idea. He said, no, 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 it's, it's perfect. Because we're talking about his whole idea of projects and how we organize our goals uh, according to projects, and teleolo our teleology is kind of chosen. And, and this will just dramatize the fact that the class is gathered there to hear us. And if we don't show up, it'll show that they're so dependent on their group, on the project. And the I thought, yeah, this, this will make the point, and it will get us an F. Do not, <laughs> we don't want to do this. But he says, no, 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 this is fine. So anyway, he has the car. I don't have the car. I'm not in control of this situation. So we get back. We show up for class 10 minutes late. OK, everybody's been sitting there in the seminar room waiting for us for 10 minutes. They're furious. And he, I, I sort of like, well, um, we meant to do this. <laughs> and then had him explain it. And it, what can I say? It was the 70s. The professor thought, oh, this is like, Hip gorilla presentation. <laughs> okay, that's cool. I thought, oh my God. <laughs> so he was right. Okay. <laughs> he was right. I guess that's true. But he was somebody who like disappeared at the very beginning, didn't show up until the very end, and then insisted we be late. Okay, and and somehow it worked out okay. But only, I mean, if it had been five years before or five years later, this would have been a terrible idea. Luckily, it was at a time when most members of the faculty were stoned and had no idea what was going on. Anyway, if that guy's the professor, it works out. But otherwise, <laughs> it's crazy. OK, so anyway, that is the way a lot of group projects go. And it's the same in any kind of organization. You have, and it, organizations love this. They appoint a committee, because that way they figure oh, we're not depending entirely on one person, right? If we're depending just on her, and then she gets sick, or she quits. Where are we? But if we've got a group of people over here working on it, that's OK. We're not so dependent on any one person. But the problem is, well, actually, you still sort of are. Because <laughs> it goes this way. And if this guy gets sick or quits, then where are you? So actually, it doesn't help. And it just frustrates that one person who says, wait, I'm doing 99% of the work, and I'm getting 1 fourth of the credit. Yeah. Uh, one of my friend's mom, uh, she was the president of the PTA like, like four years like we were like in high school or something like that. And after like, all her kids were gone, she still was like somehow in charge of running the PTA in like a shadow government, basically. She, <laughs> so even, even when she has no skin in the game, she still like does 99% of the work. Uh, I, I like the concept of a shadow government of the PTA. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, this can actually happen. And I've known of other situations like that, too, where even though it's officially not your responsibility, you're the only one who knows what's going on. And so guess what? Even after the group project is over, that one guy who did 99% of the work is the only one who knows how to do anything. And so ends up getting dumped on even afterwards when they get no credit at all. <laughs> so there are worse things than getting only a quarter of the credit, namely getting no credit. OK, let's go back to another alternative. Um, actually, I suppose we could ask this first. How do we get the better option? So if we're in a stag hunt like this, how do we push things in this direction as opposed to this direction? It is a problem for Rousseau himself. He's thinking, OK, these are both options now. So if I say, and he, look, in the social contract, his idea is you commit everything to the social contract, and then you get everything in return. It's a good deal for you, because when you cooperate, we do much better than we could do individually. So cooperation, as it were, enlarges the pie, and then you get your fair share of the pie. That's more than you could have done on your own. Well, but that's only if everybody actually commits, right? If, uh, so if enough people are free riders, then you're in trouble. So how do you stop people from being free riders, as they often are in these group projects? Yeah? So this one, you could go to like hunting grounds where stags are more prevalent than hares, so it's more likely that other people are hunting stags too rather than hares. Just more. Oh, OK, that's interesting. Yes, you can do things to improve the odds. So if, for example, the more likely we think it is we're going to succeed in getting the stag, then the more people are going to find it rational to choose this instead of that, the less tempted they will be to defect. And so you might think, look, here's one way. Make this more attractive, right? The worry is, 
I'm going to say I'll settle for my second choice. <laughs> uh, and it becomes pretty rational to settle for your second choice if you think your odds of getting the first choice aren't that great. So improve the odds of actually achieving this. And you might think, okay, so if I make that more likely, so in short, the more we can do to facilitate the outcome, right, then the, the more likely it is people will commit to it. If, on the other hand, it's one of those things that is really difficult, um, look, I'm looking for volunteers. It's near certain death, you know. <laughs> um, the way will be difficult. You will suffer unthinkably. In the end, all I can offer you is everlasting fame. Um, yeah, I mean, that turned out to be an incredibly uh, effective recruitment <laughs> technique. <laughs> However, you might say, look, um, usually, if I make it seem like the chances of success are more likely, people are going to be more willing to do it. So that's one way. Other ways, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was going to say along those lines, you could, it's the killer rabbit in Monty Python, but you could, you could reverse it and instead of the killer rabbit, um, you have the killer deer. And everyone is so terrified of the deer that they hunt the rabbit instead. Ah, uh, that's true. So if this is very dangerous, Right? then it may be that people go for this. As you identified earlier, it's a question of choosing the safer option. And so it's like, look, the more dangerous this becomes, <laughs> the more appealing it is to settle for your second choice. And so if we want to push people here, we try to remove any dangers or barriers there and maybe build some in here. Indeed, bringing in the killer rabbit will help, right? Oh, that bunny might be a killer bunny. <laughs> Yes? You could lie to them and say, no, no, the stag's really, really dangerous. Um, most people who hunt it die. So you're your best off hunting a rabbit. And if they want the stag, and they're the only, and they're, they're gullible enough to believe us, then, then we're the only ones hunting it. Well, but that's bad, right? I mean, if we're the only ones hunting the stag, we're not going to get it. In fact, we'll be left out in the cold. You need help to hunt the stag. You need help to hunt the stag, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think he means. Uh, they would be the only groups. Like other yeah. people wouldn't, wouldn't be trying, so that's yeah, yeah. getting rid of. Oh, I see. Yes, yes, yes. Getting ah, rid of the competition. getting rid of the competition. Yeah. I get it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, indeed, one way to do this is to just lie to people, and there are a number of lies you could do. One is to try to scare any competition away. One would be to say, "Oh, but the stag is so wonderful." One would be to say, "But those buddies are awfully dangerous." Um, one would be to say it's pretty hard to catch those rabbits too, um, and so on and so forth. So there would be many ways of trying to either make it true that, or at least propagandize and make people think that. Yeah. Uh, you could speak in the pop up right before, like, hey, if you guys catch the stag, <laughs> you get like first pick of like the, like the antlers or whatever you need to like make tools or like as a trophy or whatever. Oh well, good. So what does what do societies do? They often grant higher status to that, right? The, the person who gets the stag and brings it back, they may wear those antlers as a headdress or whatever it is, right? They, they actually get to, they get an increase in status. They are the ones who say, yeah, I am the mighty hunter, okay? There's a reason why hunters often have like the head of a deer that they've shot um, stuffed and put on the wall, right? They get bragging rights. Look at that, or the fisherman who has the huge fish on the wall or this type of thing. Um, and so there's an increase in social status for doing that. If, on the other hand, you say, well, you know, so what did you do? And you say, well, I, I caught some bunny rabbits. Um, it's like, well, that's not very impressive, right? Hell, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, so, so yeah, that kind of, it's not always, in short, a, a tangible reward. Sometimes it is this, you, you increase the status of people cooperating. You, you give them social rewards for cooperating. And conversely, you create social disincentives to actually defect and do, uh, do the opposite, just settle for the hair, play it safe. OK, well, let's move on to a different kind of game. It's a game that's very similar in a way, except that the multiple Nash equilibria here are not ones where you have to do the same thing as the other person. They are where you're doing a different thing. So think of a game of chicken. This is a scene from Rebel Without a Cause, the James Dean movie where two people play a game of chicken in their very cool 1950s automobiles. 
So here's the idea. They end up either racing toward each other or racing toward a cliff or whatever. And the idea is to be the one who does not swerve away. Okay? Um, and so imagine that the two cars are like this. And they're going and there's going to be a horrible head-on collision unless somebody swerves. But if you swerve first, at least, you're the chicken. Okay? So you're the chump. You're the one everybody says, whoa. You know? And so you suffer loss of social status. Whereas if you're the one who showed bravery and did not swerve, risking death, you're the one who shows that he was the rebel without a cause. And you get the girl and all this. Now, okay, so there's the thought. Well, what happens if both swerve? They're both chicken. There's no crash, but at least they live. <laughs> now, what happens if, let's say I'm player A. What happens if I go straight? I don't swerve. The other guy swerves. I win, okay? My first choice. I'm the brave one. That other guy's the chicken. Um, and meanwhile, yeah, that's bad for him. He's the chicken. Conversely, if I chicken out first, then ah, that's bad. I'm the chicken. I live, but with this shame. Whereas he's the one who's the hero. What happens if we both go straight and neither one swerves? Well, then there's a horrible head-on collision. We both die. But you're both heroes. Don't you both heroes? But we're both heroes. <laughs> yes, so one question is, in filling out the game table, we have to know, so is it death before dishonor or dishonor before death? I've drawn this the way a chicken analyzes this chicken game, which is to say death is worse. I'm sorry. I'd rather be a chicken than dead. Uh, however, that is not the way maybe they see it. Maybe they would rather you know, come back on who come back with their shield or on it, as the mother of the ancient warrior said. Um, you know, so maybe they actually think, no, better to die in a fiery crash than to suffer the dishonor of being the chicken. Yeah, right. That's right. Then we will see you in hell, right? And we'll play chicken in hell. Anyhow, suppose we think of the game this way. Then we think, well, let's look at it from A's point of view. If the other person's going to swerve, I should just go straight, right? That gives me the best option. If I swerve too, then it looks like, eh, we're both chickens. So at least I, have, I get to share the shame. That's better than just being the only chicken. But still, I'd rather be the one who's the hero then, so I want to go straight. But suppose the other guy goes straight. Well, then if I go straight too, I'm dead. So then I realize I am kind of a chicken. I'd rather swerve. And the other person, let's say, analyzes it the same way. They think, look, if you're going to swerve, then I want to go straight. But if you're going to go straight and you're not going to swerve, oh, I guess I'd rather swerve than be dead. So there's the way the arrows go in terms of the preferences. And now if we say, so where are the Nash equilibria? They're here. There are two of them again, but they're ones where the players are doing different things. One of them is swerving. And so being the chicken, the other is going straight, being the hero. Okay? So there are these two Nash equilibria. But in a way, this is a harder game than the, 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 the stag hunt game because now we get a situation where they have to do different things. Before, we could kind of agree, look, we're going to hunt the stag, right? And we could punish people who disagree. But in this case, wait, we have to do different things. It's best if we don't both do this. It'll be a disaster if we both do this. But if we both do this, we both suffer shame. And so that's bad for us, too. So it's best if one of us actually gets to be the hero and the other gets to be the chicken. But I don't want to be the chicken. <laughs> Hence, it's easy to see this sort of thing happening. Now, the question is, well, suppose we find ourselves in this kind of position. What do we do? Yeah. <laughs> Buy a Dodge Ram and only tr a tr challenge of somebody in a Prius. Yeah, that's, that's not bad advice. Um, I was in a pretty serious car accident a while ago, but it was against a guy in a Prius. So, uh, when, the, when the race starts, you have to just put in like, a dummy and just like, put a brick on the gas. Just call it that. A dummy? That, I mean, that's just a hyper chicken solution. Don't even get in the car. Just have it faked. Uh, but if no one else knows. 
Convince your twin brother to do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, ooh, okay, good. So we could try to change the payoffs. Indeed, you could say, listen, you know, neither one of us wants to die, right? But neither one of us wants the full burden of the shame. So what if we make an agreement, you know, like this time I'm going to swerve. I get to be the, but then I'm going to challenge you to a rematch. That time you swerve. And I'll pay you something so that, you know, you, you go along with this scheme. And if I pay you enough, maybe you have an incentive to actually. Isn't the prize the girl? Maybe they're, they're well, that's true. If the, pri if the prize is the girl, then what can I offer to pay you to? A lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you'd be happy with Donna over there, right? I mean, you don't really need. <laughs> yeah. In view of Title IX, I'm going to say no more about them. <laughs> uh, but actually, I mean, look, this is not a bad analysis of the singles bar scene <laughs> and other things like that, where you might think, oh gosh, yeah, there is something like this, uh, this weird competition for, um, now, yes, it could be social status in general, it could be getting the girl, it could be, I mean, later in the corporate world, it could be something else, right? Um, because you're thinking, okay, I'm competing for this thing against the other junior people in the per firm, et cetera, so it is, a little bit like a game of chicken. I want to compete for this. On the other hand, I am in danger of getting myself into a destructive battle where I'm viewed as a troublemaker and maybe they decide to get rid of both of us. So how do I play that game? How do I actually come across as, <laughs> well, what Aristotle, as having what Aristotle described as that nameless virtue? Not being too ambitious, but not being unambitious. Instead, being just the right degree of you know, yes, I, I strive for excellence, but I'm a team player. <laughs> okay, that kind of thing. Um, it, it's like, ooh, how do I manage this when I'm in a situation a bit like this? Yeah. You could try to convince the other party that you are mad now, like take off the wheel, just show them the wheel. Um, oh, you're, you're just, perfect. Yeah, it goes right all the way over there. Absolutely right. If I'm looking at this situation, I might think, look, look, look. <laughs> Here's, how do I get what I want? I want you to swerve. Well, how can I best get you to swerve, convince you I'm going to go straight? And then you think, oh, look, he's going straight, so I got a choice here. Um, I better swerve. And so I try to convince you I'm the madman who will stop at nothing. So indeed, I take off the steering wheel, throw it out the window. It's like, ha, 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 now. Now, actually, as a negotiating strategy, this is enormously powerful. I show you, I don't have any choice, okay? I've already made my full commitment. And it's like, I'm sticking to this no matter what. And if I put myself in that position, now it's like, you gotta either go with me or not because there's no way I'm backing down. So uh, a good example of this, again, in the ancient world is the general who invades, burns the ship behind him or burns the bridge behind him. It says, look, here we are, guys. We're either gonna win this fight or we're gonna die here on the beach. We can't retreat. Um, that's a way of saying we're full, we're all in, <laughs> right? And that's kind of the equivalent there, saying I'm all in. So what are you gonna do? You got a choice between this option and that option. And that's one way of trying to get the other person to back down. Um, a scary way, because if you do it at the same time, right? <laughs> you throw your Siri wheel out and then you know, He's doing the same thing. <laughs> oh, crap! <laughs> so, I mean, in most negotiations, that just means it breaks down and, you know, you don't get the house or the job or whatever it is. But in this case, yeah, you both die. So, and indeed, if both generals, let's say in this fight, say it's a fight to the death. Um, a modern equivalent to that, by the way, is Stalin. 
saying, if you're captured by the enemy, you're going to be either killed or sent to a prison camp if, we, if you're liberated and we retake you. And similarly, if you retreat, not only do we have soldiers behind you who are going to shoot you, but also we're going to go back and execute your entire family. Um, that was a way of saying, there's no retreat. You fight to the death. And if you're captured or if you try to chicken out, you're dead. So that's a way of holding you to that sort of thing. Now, it is very hard to formulate a strategy. The difference between this game and a prisoner's dilemma is that in a prisoner's dilemma, each player has a dominant strategy. Um, it looks like you are better off confessing, no matter what the other person does. That's not true here, right? Neither player has a dominant strategy. A dominant strategy is one that's better than other than any other, no matter what the other players do. Well, here, what you should do really does depend on what the other player is doing. And you don't have something you should do where you're better off no matter what the other player does. There is no dominant strategy. That makes it very hard to formulate a strategy for dealing with this. The problem isn't, hey, I can formulate my own strategy. The problem is if we all do that, we end up with a suboptimal outcome. Here the problem is, I don't know what I ought to do independently of what you're doing. It really totally depends on what you're doing. Now, there are lots of examples like this. Every group project can be viewed either as a stag hunt or as something like this, where you might say, look, suppose you and I are supposed to cooperate on something. I can either work hard on it or slack off. You can either work hard or slack off. Well, suppose we work, both work hard on it. Well, that's good. We'll do well. On the other hand, it's even better if you do all the work and I get to slack off. <laughs> right? That's my first choice. Of course, that's your first choice. And the worst of all is if we both slack off and nobody does it. Well, OK, so what happens? I think, hmm, yeah, I would rather, if you're going to work hard on it, I'd rather slack off. But if you're going to slack off, I better do the work. And that's just like that chicken game. Conversely, you think, hey, <laughs> if you're going to work hard on it, I can slack off. But if you're going to slack off, I better do the work. And so put those together, and we get, again, two Nash equilibria, where we're doing different things. One of us is going to end up slacking off. One of us is going to end up doing all the work, which is exactly the reason I told you that silly story about the SART presentation. It's what happened. And it's natural for that to happen. There are these two Nash equilibria. But on the other hand, neither player has a dominant strategy. So it is something like a game of chicken. Who's going to do the work? And it's a question of who panics first. <laughs> I was always the first panicker. Yeah? Does this situation not take into account because if one person is doing it, that's not guaranteed that it will be as good work as they both are? That is true. So here the assumption is, look, um, I'm really just as happy with the outcome, if, let's say, in this case, you do a fine job all by yourself. What if it really requires two people? Then you're back in that stag hunt situation. So the difference between this and the stag hunt is really that in the case of the stag hunt, for us to get the stag, we both have to cooperate. Here the thought is, one of us could do the project on our own. Um, and so one of us could succeed. But you're right, in the real world, often we're in between. If we both work together, we'll get an A. If one of us does all the work and the other slacks off, we'll get a B. If neither of us does the work, we'll fail. Um, or actually, being UT students, we're pretty good at just making something up on the spot and we'll get a C. Uh, <laughs> or, let's be frank, a B minus. <laughs> okay? And so when those are the payoffs, you might think, well, wait a minute, how badly do I want the A as opposed to the B as opposed to the B minus, et cetera. Um, and all of that makes a difference. OK, well, we're almost out of time. I'm going to skip this next bit because it's really just a minor variant. And finally get to what is the best scenario of all, in a way, the prisoner's delight. OK, this is just like a prisoner's dilemma, except we automatically get the best outcome. So it's a situation like this, really, where, hey, my first choice would be I sit back and let you do all the work. Of course, the converse is your first choice. But if we both cooperate, that's our second choice. If we both defect, that's our third choice. So here's the sort of scenario. We're both in the rowboat. We're hungry. We want to get to the other side of the river so we can have some dinner. 
Well, I can do all the rowing myself, but it'll take us longer. On the other hand, if we both row, we'll get there faster, and we're both hungry. So we both have an incentive to row faster. So we both have an incentive to actually cooperate. If we think about these, this in these terms, we can say, well, all right, suppose you are going to cooperate and row. Well, I can either cooperate and row with you, which gets us there pretty fast, or I can defect, and then we go slower. But I'm hungry. Um, so actually, I would rather cooperate. And if you're going to defect and just sit there, I still want to row, because darn it, I want to get there. And at least I'll get there eventually, whereas if we both defect, we're going to be both here hungry. And you think of it the same way. So we end up with one Nash equilibrium, and we, neither of us gets our first choice, which is just to like sit back and do nothing. But on the other hand, we do end up getting there fast and getting food. So what is the difference between a prisoner's delight, a stag hunt, a game of chicken, and a prisoner's dilemma? And it comes down to just this. In the prisoner's delight, my cooperation, my rowing benefits me even if you don't cooperate. In a stag hunt, it's a waste of time. I get no benefit. And in a prisoner's dilemma, I actually suffer if you don't cooperate. I get the heavy penalty. So here's the question that divides all of these and becomes the crucial question for us in policy, within organizations and in society. What happens if I pitch in and cooperate and other people don't? What happens if they are free riders or betray me? Do I get some benefit anyway? Do I lose and suffer? Or does it just make what I've done pointless? That's what divides these, and that is crucial for determining what the outcome is likely to be. Next time, we'll try to figure out then how we think about this as an individual and as an organization.